El Extraordinario. Extraordinario. When I hear what we call music, it seems to me that someone is talking and talking about his feelings or about his ideas of relationships. But when I hear uh, traffic, the sound of traffic here on Sixth Avenue, for instance, I don't have the feeling that anyone is talking. I have the feeling that uh, sound is acting. That was John Cage speaking to us from 1991. Cage was one of the most influential composers and thinkers of the 20th century. Although I doubt Ursula Bloom would have appreciated New York's traffic the way he did, I'm pretty sure they would have hit it off if they'd known each other. Now let's listen to a fragment of 433, one of Cage's best-known pieces. It was composed to be played by any combination of instruments, and it sounds something like this. You didn't hear anything, did you? Although, you probably did. You probably heard the noise of the street if you're walking somewhere, or the sound of water coming out of the tap if you're doing the dishes, or maybe even your own breath if you're working out while listening to this podcast. John Cage composed 433 in 1952. The only thing printed on the score is the Latin word tacit, which is used to inform the performer that their instrument is to remain silent for a long section of the music. In this case, the interval lasts 4 minutes and 33 seconds. For Cage, the point of this composition was to prove that any sound or group of sounds can be music if it's perceived as such by the listener. Over the course of those 4 minutes and 33 seconds, the audience can hear the outside world while the piece is being performed. And those sounds cannot be controlled by the composer, the performer, or the audience. It also invites us to change the way we listen to the world around us paying attention to the noises that we usually ignore as we go about our business. Chance, improvisation, and environment are the three pillars of John Cage's composition, which continues to influence many today. I traveled back to Geneva yesterday because I want to see and hear a composition by one of his followers. To help me do so, I reached out to Adrian Favre, who works at Mamco, Switzerland's largest contemporary art museum. So we're standing outside the entrance to Mamco, the museum where you work. Yes, that's right. And I got in touch with you because you were involved in staging the Tony Conrad exhibition. Can you tell me a little bit about him? Uh, sure, yeah. Uh, well, uh, Tony Conrad was an American filmmaker. He was a musician. Uh, he was also a music composer. And, and most important is that he was a pioneer of structural film and minimalist music. And this exhibition tries to retrace his career from a... Uh, well, actually, let's just go in. I, I will show you. Cool. Adrian doesn't look anything like the other museum staff I've met during this trip. Judging by the way he dresses and carries himself, I would have thought he was in a rock band about to go on stage. Momco is located in an old factory and has an industrial vibe that reminds me of Berlin. His look fits right in here. Is this the piece I asked you about? Well, yes, yes. It's called The Flicker. It's one of the most important part of his work. And Conrad made the film in 1966 when he noticed the flickering light of an old projector. And that inspired him to study the impact of flickers on brainwaves. And this led him to create uh, the sequence of black and white films. Uh-huh. How long is it? Around 30 minutes. I think it's about to end. But how can you tell? It's just flickers of light. Yes, but the rhythm and the sequence of these patterns are changing. And once you've watched it a couple of times, you will start to recognize the structure. Would you like to sit down? Yeah, thanks. The screening room is small and dark. We sit on a couple of chairs that have been placed in the center of the room, facing away from the projector. The sequence we were talking about is projected on the screen in front of us. I wanted to come and see the film because I read it has hallucinatory effects on its viewers. I don't know how long I watched it for because after a certain point, I lost track of time. The flickering light combined with the sound of the projector put me in a state of, I'm not gonna say hypnosis, but it certainly felt dreamlike. It was as if I was no longer in that room, as if I'd been transported into a larger, almost infinite space with abstract patterns coming out of the screen. I found it hard to look away. 
The film ends abruptly and loops back to the beginning. Before the title appears on screen, the piece opens with a disclaimer saying that the producer, distributor, and exhibitors waive all liability for any physical or mental injury caused by the motion picture. The other reason why I'm back in Geneva is because I'm meeting Diane Smith. Diane is a neurologist and researcher who works at the University of Geneva. We arranged to walk along the lake up to the Jet d'eau, a huge fountain that propels water 140 meters into the air. Geneva is a big city, and lots of people move here to work. But as you approach the Jardin Anglais and the path surrounding Lake Geneva, it becomes calmer. It's almost as if the water forces its residents to slow down and take a deep breath. Today, it's so foggy that as we walk past the jetties, it feels like we're floating in midair. It's as if I were still watching the projection in the museum. Has it actually affected me? Or has my obsession with the piece made me more suggestible than I was before? I begin by asking Diane if light, music, and noise can have a mental or physical effect on our state of mind. Yeah, absolutely. You know, for instance, exposure to noise can be very harmful. It, it can trigger both pathophysiologic and psychopathologic alterations. Mm-hmm. Okay, so pathophysiologic effects alter the nervous system, the circulatory system, and the respiratory system. They can cause anything from gastrointestinal disorders to alterations in the bloodstream, uh, balance, or, or even vision. On the other hand, psychopathologic effects refer to feelings of restlessness, anxiety, decreased attention span, lack of interest, lack of initiative, uh, even aggressiveness or personality changes. In the most extreme cases, they can even trigger mental disorders. And how long would you have to be exposed to a sound for it to have that kind of effect? Bearing a few exceptions, you would have to be exposed to them for a long period of time. All right. Look, I'll give you another example. Mm -hmm. Okay. A team of researchers at MIT have just spent the last few years working on a treatment to alleviate the effects of Alzheimer's. They're doing it by sending auditory signals to the hippocampus and the prefrontal cortex of the brain. Right, so, so far, the treatment has been shown to alleviate the symptoms of the disease, although the effect is still only temporary. Each session lasts at least an hour. That's fascinating. No, it really is. Although the project is still in its infancy, it, it has shown great promise. Does that mean that sound has the same effect on everyone? No, not at all. For starters. So it depends on the context and the location. You know, sound is all about vibration. Look, see, hearing these seagulls, for example, hearing them in person isn't the same as hearing them from your recording, right? Hmm, makes sense. Well, and then on top of that, the same sound doesn't necessarily have the same effect on different people, regardless of them experiencing it in identical or very similar conditions. You know, going back to the research team at MIT, they've also found that the treatment they're developing has absolutely no effect on certain people. Okay, so we can rule out the possibility of the same sound having the same effect on anyone that hears it, especially if they aren't exposed to the sound for a long time. Right? Well, what type of sound are we talking about here? A melody. I'm guessing it's played at a normal volume? Yeah. Okay, and what sort of effect would it trigger? Well, the melody would make you happy or do the exact opposite and make you sad or even feel pain. Or it could be used to heal some sort of trauma. Mm, I see. No, I don't really see that happening. You know, some types of music are used in psychological therapy, but in those cases, the music itself isn't what causes the effect. It's just one part of the therapy. And then there's the other thing I was saying. What works for one person doesn't always work for another. Hmm, I get it. In any case, the melody would need to have very specific frequencies. I wouldn't say it's impossible, but it is highly unlikely. Any thoughts? I liked what she said at the end. Highly unlikely. But not impossible. <laughs> you always have to have the last word, don't you? It's what she said. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> you were right, okay? Maybe I have gotten a little carried away with the story. That's why I reached out to the neurologist. I wanted to find out if the effects of all this chanting could be backed up by science. How do you feel about it now? Well, you heard Diane. 
It's not impossible, but it is highly improbable. Anyway, that's not the point. I'm here to research Ursula Bloom's story. Okay, so what's your next move? I'm planning on going to Los Angeles next to see the other photo exhibition Christina mentioned. Amanda has the day off tomorrow, so she's gonna tag along. I really appreciate you joining me today. Nah, don't mention it. I love those Anne, and plus the weather is gorgeous this morning. I can't think of a better way to spend my day. Mm, yeah, but I'm gonna be going on and on about my podcast all day. You do know what you're getting yourself into, right? <laughs> I'm afraid I am, yeah. <laughs> I know. I feel like I need to bounce ideas off with someone. Mm -hmm. I have all these loose ends, but none of them really make sense. Okay, what do you think is missing? Well, if we put aside potential supernatural phenomena, I can see there's a direct link between the Medieval Votes' Day Society and the Nooms written on Ursula Bloom's score. Okay. But even though the monks lived in St. Gallen, how did she find out about them? Like, does it have anything to do with the members of the Blue Rider? Some of the artists who signed the group's manifesto were musicians. Which ones? Uh, one sec, let's see. The manifesto included artworks by Schoenberg, Webern, Scriabin... Oh my god, Scriabin. What about Scriabin? Alright, so those musicians, all those musicians you just mentioned, um, were... Let's just say they were trailblazers, okay? Mm -hmm. So they started to experiment with atonality, and they composed very avant-garde music for their time. In fact, Schoenberg was John Cage's music teacher for a while. Well, really? Yeah, he was a major influence on him and other modern composers as were Byrne and Webern. But Scriabin is a horse of another color. <laughs> How come? Well, he was a bit of a fruitcake, although... The others weren't exactly the same as Bunch either. <laughs> if I remember correctly, Schoenberg was terrified of the number 13. Amanda's right. The fear of the number 13 is known as Triskaidekaphobia, and Schoenberg suffered it all his life. So much so that he died on Friday the 13th in a year that was a multiple of 13, brought about by the stress and anxiety of his phobia. I guess most musical geniuses have a couple of screws loose, if you know what I mean. <laughs> but anyway... There was more to Scriabin because he was also really into occultism. Oh. He often used a chord in his compositions that he called the mystic chord. This is what it sounds like. Although Scriabin didn't refer to it as the mystic chord, he called it the chord of Pleroma, or the totality of divine powers. To give you an insight into what he was like, when Scriabin died, he was working on a composition called Mysterium, which he never completed. Mm -hmm. And his dream was to perform it somewhere in the Himalayas, and he truly believed that listening to this music would bring about a complete transformation of humanity. <laughs> I guess we'll never know if it would have worked. I guess not. <laughs> but nobody has refuted Scriabin's theory yet, so... We get to Lausanne before the museum opens and take the subway down to Ushi, where we're greeted by a different view of Lake Geneva. There's not a cloud in the sky and I can see the majestic mountains towering over the horizon. In this country, they're always part of the landscape, wherever you are. I wish they would sing to me, so I could hear them like Ursula did. Before we arrive, I take some time to read up on Scriabin on the train. Although Kandinsky included an article he wrote in the Blue Rider Manifesto, they didn't really know each other. However, they did have a couple of things in common. They were both Russian, they both associated colors with music, and they were both heavily influenced by the principles of theosophy. Theosophy, huh? That rings a bell. Wasn't it a sort of religion founded by a Russian woman? Helena mm -hmm. something? Helena Blavatsky. That's it. Helena Blavatsky was a controversial figure in the 19th century. In 1875, she founded the Theosophical Society, an occultist group that sought to understand the wisdom of God. Their doctrine, theosophy, Combine science, philosophy, and religion with oriental spirituality. Do you think Ursula Bloom was a follower just like Kandinsky? Do you think that's what links them to Votes of State? Well, I'm going to have to look into it further when we get home. I did read, however, that theosophists use music as a medium to connect with the divine. That's what Scriabin believed, right? Yeah, theosophy had a major influence on Scriabin. But I haven't been able to find a link between theosophy and the Votes of State Society. Well, maybe there isn't one. What do you mean? 
Okay, uh, when we were on the train before, I said these musicians had a bit of a screw loose, but perhaps I was being a little unfair. Okay. After all, having an interest in occultism was common at the time. Everywhere you look back then, you find artists dabbling in esoteric activities. And there were so many different branches as well. <laughs> so I see. <laughs> Something similar was happening in France as well. Around the same time, Satie and Debussy were active members of the Rosicrucian order. Okay. Back in early 20th century Europe, if you weren't a Rosicrucian, Freemason, medium, theosophist, or a member of one of these secret societies, you were nobody. Oh, come on. <laughs> I mean it. <laughs> It's easy for us to dismiss these pseudoscientific beliefs as ridiculous, but, but they still hadn't been debunked. Yeah, yeah, I, I guess you're right. Look, all I'm saying is that maybe it wasn't Kandinsky or Scriabin or the other Blue Rider members who got Ursula Bloom into occultism. Maybe their shared beliefs brought them together. We get to the Musée de l'Elysée after walking across Plateforme 10, a sprawling esplanade that is home to the most important museums in the city. I think what we're looking for is over there. Cool, let's go. I realize that I'm feeling overwhelmed. Is it because of the buildings towering over me, or is it because I'm nervous about uncovering a new piece of the puzzle that is Ursula's life? Emma, look, they're over here. The exhibition features Gabrielle Munter's photographic archive. There are several photos of trips to Tunisia and Italy with Kandinsky. If it wasn't because they're in black and white, some of the scenes would look like paintings. They're also casual portraits, and judging by their smiles, they look like friends and family. There's also a whole series of photos taken in front of a brick wall inside a courtyard. The only picture where Gabriel Munter appears is badly framed, and it was supposedly taken by Kandinsky. Here she is, next to Gabriel Munter. This is Ursula Bloom. Huh. And who are the others? Let's see. From left to right, Gabriel Munter, Ursula Bloom, Maria Mark, Bernard Kohler, Thomas von Hartmann. Oh, he was also a musician. The man who appears seated here is Franz Mark, and this one is Victor Bloom. Was Ursula married? No, no. Victor is the kid from the photo I saw in the other museum. Her cousin, the engineer. Wow. It seems like they stayed close when they grew up. Look, here they are together. What are they holding? It looks like a box. Ursula and Victor are half laughing as they pose proudly holding a wooden box with carved panels. On the upper part of the front panel, we are able to make out just three words. Dum vixi tacui mortua dulce cana. Wait, what? What did you just say? Oh, it's Latin. You can only read the first three words here, but I bet the others were carved into the... But wait, uh, how do you know that phrase? Oh, why? Vixi tacui mortua and dulce cana are the names of the artworks Ursula Bloom painted at the psychiatric hospital. What? I had no idea. You never mentioned it before. It means, while I lived, I remained silent. Now that I'm dead, I sing sweetly. Oh, but It's how... a phrase that appears sometimes carved into old musical instruments. I've seen it on a couple of clavichords and stuff like that. It refers to the wood, you know? As if the wood was uttering those words. The wood used to make the instruments. Yes. So, if they carve them into the box they're holding, it means it's a... An instrument. A music box? Mm-hmm. Yes. It's probably a music box. 